Hello and welcome to this. It's Love Rugby League Weekly in association with our supporters, Vet Fred. Um, we, it's very rare that we get two takes at something, isn't it? I could have done with two <laughs> takes at the weekend with cup draws, to be fair. But um, I'm Dave Parkinson, delighted to be alongside James Messenger, as per usual. And some stranger called James Gordon's ended up uh, wandering in here, yeah, right, James? Yeah, I'm here, Dave, thanks. You've just stepped off the streets as well. I know, sorry, I've not worn my uh, branded... My branded tops. Uh, here's where you can throw it back to me. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, well, you missed out on my gag in the first take. <laughs> I was going to say, how come Dave's not wore a suit for uh, Love Rugby League Weekly? Having, you know, you put your Sunday best on for the 1895 and women's cup draws, didn't Got you? Got to make an impression. Got to make an impression. It's well, we were suitably impressed. There was a little screenshot going around our uh, WhatsApp group. <laughs> and that, that, uh, that caught, a few, caught a bit of attention. Uh, the suit's actually hung up. I've got a job interview tomorrow, so we'll see what happens with that one. Uh, right, um, so, fellas, what's been appearing on site? Quick run through, if I can remember it all. Usual stuff, paper tour, off the record gossip column. Uh, Drew's got a couple of good pieces out today. J an expansionist blog with Jamaica, who, of course, qualified for the next World Cup. Um, a talent spotter on St. Helens Hooker, Aaron Smith. He's starting to get a bit, a few more raps now, so that uh, signed a new contract this week as well. All the latest on Leeds and what's going on, the, the potential favourites or the potential new coach at Leeds following Dave Fern's departure. I'm not sure I agree with that potential, but we have got him to discuss in the... Uh, in the, the hat. Yeah, right. well, so let's crack on then. We're going completely off the hat, apart from one thing. It's Challenge Cup weekend. It's round six. What do you reckon? So here are the fixtures for starters. So uh, this evening, tomorrow evening. Yeah, it's Thursday today. Thursday, yeah, so yeah. Friday, Friday, Friday night, Friday night. Dewsbury against Halifax, Hull FC against Castleford Tigers, Wakefield Trinity against Widnes Vikings. Then on Saturday, we've got Bradford Bulls against Leeds Rhinos, Catalans Dragons against Doncaster, Salford Red Devils against Hull Kingston Rovers. Sunday, two ties, Huddersfield Giants against St. Helens, Warrington Wolves against Wigan. What do you reckon? There's yeah, some good ties in there. I, I can't see past uh, Bradford v Leeds being the uh, the pick of the pick of the games. I think it's been a while since they've played each other competitively. It'd be nice to renew that rivalry. We've been trying to get it get it going on social media this week, and I hope I hope that they get a very big crowd because that that has the potential to be perhaps an upset. Obviously, Leeds have been quite indifferent this season, shall we say? And going up against a Bradford side, will be looking for the big scalp, get the names into the next round of the draw. It should be, should be quite interesting. Once upon a time, it was the biggest derby in rugby league. They were trying to get that back, weren't they, with uh, what it said at the back of the people when they were having... The, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, obviously Bradford will fancy it. Obviously John Kerr's got a bit of a, a bit of history, hasn't he, with, with Challenge Cup upsets. And certainly if Bradford beat Leeds, that would be a bit of a... a bit of an upset and a real boost, I suppose, to Bradford's uh, overall season, if they can... They can manage it. It'd be nice as well to have, I know, well, certainly not the Friday night game, but at least the Saturday and Sunday televised games are standalone so everyone can watch them. That's one of my little bugbears at the moment is when there's a TV game on and there's about five other games on in Super League at the same time. And It's not quite standalone, but I'll come uh, to that later on. Yeah, so, you know, it should be it should be some good ones. Jewsby Halifax is an interesting one because, of course, one of them is going to make it through to the, to the quarterfinals. Um, so there means at least one championship team will make it through. You've seen both of those sides, have you? Yeah, uh, yeah, you, yeah. You've yeah. played against Halifax as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you make when you compare like with like? I thought. I mean, Halifax were obviously Halifax were obviously very disappointing early in the season compared to what you expected of them from previous seasons. Obviously, they've lost Richard Marshall now as well, so you just don't know how that's necessarily affected them. Um, I thought Dewsbury were very well organised. You know, don't get me wrong; they've not, you know, they're not world beaters, but they've got a decent. Um, they were certainly a lot better than what I was anticipating them to be. I, you know, I tipped them to to finish in the bottom two, and you know, I'm not saying they're not going to be down there, but you know, they've got a decent. They've got two very good halfbacks. Um, you know, they've got two decent centres. Um, one of which is, has only just been switched to centre. Yeah, he's been the only oh, yeah. And then, and then, you know, in the pack as well, you know, Robbie Ward's, you know, he's done a job at Hooker for for a few clubs, um, sorry, for a few years. And, you know, Michael Knowles as well. I think the thing that I think, well, when they've certainly played with Witness, when, what Witness struggle was, is Knowles at back row gives you like another playmaking option, doesn't he? And he's on yeah. the shoulder of, say, Simon Brown or, or Liam Finn and, and if it breaks down for whatever reason, he's there to provide that, you know, added 
whatever it is. So um, I know they had a bit of a iffy result against Toulouse last week, a bit of a after the Lord Mayor show type of performance. But um, I think Jewsby will fancy it at home. It's just, you know, I suppose you always ask the question with the Cups, is it's like, do you want that to distract from your league? Thing, but Jews will think, well, if we can get oh, if we can uh, if we can get through and get Wigan at home or something in the next round, um, you know, your mate Stephen Downs will be buzzing for that, won't he? If if oh, Jews, if yeah, Jews, yeah, if, if Jews, we can get through and get Wigan at home, or well, I'm assuming Wigan beat Warrington, but you know what I mean. If you can yeah, get yeah. some something like that, um, or even if you know, you never know, one of the other championship teams might cause an upset, and then all of a sudden, if you could get an all championship quarter final. And, James, if I can come to you as well, because we've got sort of like quite a few all Super League ties. Yeah. So on the Friday night, for example, we've got Hull against Castleford. What do you reckon with that one first of all? It'll be it'll be a close game. The the proof this season that a lot of the Yorkshire derbies, regardless of whether it's a Hull FC, a Castleford, a Huddersfield, a Wakefield, they, they all seem to they all seem to play good good rugby. They're all playing pretty well at the minute, and they've all been quite close games. I think we saw a couple in the last few weeks in particular. I think I think Hull FC will probably have too much in that game. I'd let, I'd think that they they progress, but as you say, it's, it's interesting the way the draws panned out, having a lot of Super League teams coming against each other. Because with with this cup, as James mentioned, it's not always a case of putting your your strongest team out. So any results can happen on a given day. If, for example, a Castleford turn up and throw a couple of second string players and not not that they would do that or if Hull FC decide to rotate a little they, bit they might only have second string players yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be honest as well that, that's, injuries what, at the moment. that's what it'll be with Castleford but mm. you, you think about some of the teams even some your likes of your Warrington's your Wiggins obviously you want to get far but if you're doing well in the league then you need to find that balance don't you between doing well in the league and prioritising the league but also having, having a good crack at the cup competition um, Salford and Hull Kingston Rovers James what do you reckon? I think Salford will I think Salford will fancy it um, home advantage, isn't it? I was going to um, say, is that because of the home advantage that you think? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because I think that realistically, a Salford going to make the top five. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but could they have a go at Challenge Cup? A bit like Wakefield. I mean, Wakefield have obviously got a chance of finishing the top five. But the clubs like that, who ultimately on their debt, you feel like they could be, you know, maybe with the exception of St. Helens and maybe even Warrington. They could beat anybody else. So the good thing about the Challenge Cup is you're only a couple of games away from get. You know, and if if Salford or Wakefield got to Wembley, it'd be massive, wouldn't it, for would, yeah, for those yeah. clubs? And if you think they've only got to win three games, okay, yeah, you need to have a bit of a rub of the green and a bit of luck in the draw. But you know, if you win through this round, you could get Dewsbury or Halifax in the next round, then you're in the semi-finals all of a sudden. You know what I mean? So it I sounds think, like you're back in Wakefield here as well against Wigan. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think Hull Care have probably got a bit more to worry about from a league point of view. So I think from there, I think I I, I would imagine that Salford will probably prevail. And, and almost a bit like you were saying, I mean, Salford effectively haven't really got a, a massive second string available to them. So they'll probably have a strong team out. Whereas Hull Care perhaps have got a few more younger lads that they can pull in if they wanted to um, play a weekend team. Okay. Um, James, I want you to take control of Sunday for me. Huddersfield against St Helens and Warrington against Wigan. Two, two very interesting ties. Huddersfield obviously they had a result last time out that didn't didn't quite go away but against St Helens who even even if St Helens opted to rest a couple of players we've seen already this season their strength in depth is absolutely insane. They've got a brilliant squad haven't they? They, have. they all seem to be coming to the fore as well all these younger players they're all getting just enough experience. Well, that's what it is it's like even some of the players who haven't played a lot of minutes in previous years have really stepped up this year. And even someone like Aaron Smith, who maybe not many people would have known about, and now after a few good games and he's been tipped already to be the next James Roby, and based off his performances, then there's little, little argument with that, I don't think. But I think St. Helens would probably have a bit too much against Huddersfield. I can see it being a close tie. But then as well, you look at, uh, look at Wigan v Warrington, that, that'll be another one that obviously these two sides seem to meet Every every month or so, which is it's getting ridiculous, isn't it? Between it is. Wigan and Warrington, it's like nearly every week. It's, it's like it's like a basketball series where you literally <laughs> play the same team five, six, seven times. But yeah, it'd be, that that'll be a close game. I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to think the Warrington could prevail, but again, it comes down to who wants it more on the day. Obviously, both teams have got ambitions of finishing in that in that top five in Super League. So I don't think they do anything to jeopardise that. I know 
Warrington in the last few weeks have had a few players who've been rested. Mm -hmm. This maybe could be another chance for them to rest a couple more of the big guys and maybe do a little bit of rotation because that's what every good team needs. It's not about obviously having your 13 and your subs. You, you need that rotation and the likes of Wigan, the likes of Warrington have shown that this year. But I think I think both of those games could be really, really close. I, I think it, I think it's an, a big statement opportunity for Wigan because they've not been great, but they've started to string a few wins together, haven't they? And you know they've not been they've been very scrappy. Obviously, the London game last week was a shocker, but they still won. And the week before as well against Castle. Yeah, but they've started grinding out the wins, and obviously they're moving up the table. And you could see them, you know, get. And this is a sort of game now where if if they can pull it together and, and beat Warrington, it's, well, it's a massive fillip for. Adrian Lamb, if you want, if if you like, for the for the full time coaching role, but it might just say, well, look, yeah, we've got some stuff going on, but on the pitch we can still, you know, we can still mix it up with with the best teams. Also worth noting as well that you know, obviously Wigan won the grand final, Catalan won Challenge Cup last year, so teams like Saint Helens and Warrington, they didn't win anything last year, so it's like, I mean, Saint Helens won the league leaders, and that's another that's another discussion entirely, but. Yeah, I don't know. How you can say that when they're no, top, no. top of the tree. No, yeah, but, you know, I suppose, it, no, they, no. The major, I think that I think they should, but I think that should be built up there. again. Like the I said, it's a different. Honor, yeah, the major, sort of the major two honors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think you know the league leader shield should should be completely, I mean, completely rebranded and made up to be a massive thing because it is, mm. but it isn't at the moment. And it's like if you're St. Helens and Warrington, and you, you get knocked out of Challenge Cup, all of a sudden you've got the grand final, and, and that's it for another year. Do you know what I mean? So. Um, you know, obviously Warrington had the two finals last year and lost in them both, so they'll want to go further this year. And it'll be interesting you know. as well to see the uh, the crowd figure between Warrington and Wigan. Obviously, out of out of the club's control, been scheduled yeah. on the on the Sunday opposite final day of the Premier League football season. You will wonder whether that will have a bit of a bearing on the crowd. It'll be be interesting to see. I wonder if they'll. It'd be nice to see them break maybe ten thousand, but. It, it really wouldn't surprise me if they had 89,000 fans there. Do we concentrate too much on attendance figures in rugby league? Because sometimes it does tend to sort of like go. I mean, I, I've seen loads and loads of tweets, for example, about the Toronto attendances, about this and that going on, the fact that, you know, games further down the rugby league chain might only get a couple of hundred people watching them. Do we, do we get sidetracked by that, do you reckon? Um, I think so. I, I, I think so when I... In a way, yeah. It's almost um, like it's being used as a measuring stick. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of other things that are happening in rugby league, isn't there? That yeah, I, I think it's a fair. I think it's a fair, a fair point. I mean, the other argument, and I know there's all these probably false accusations about Toronto on free tickets and stuff. It's like, well, it don't matter. It, as long yeah, as you get them in, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, say, and at the end of the day, that's them declaring it. Isn't yeah, it? So yeah, but then, I, but then, satisfying. you know, it, it does create a, a little bit of a false economy potentially if they do do that. I'm not saying that they do, but ultimately, like I say, it's, it's an attendance figure. I think. I think it, it probably more equates to the finances more so than anything else mm. because why are Warrington playing Wigan so many times this season? If they didn't have the loop, why are the loop fixes in place? And it's purely financial, isn't it? Basically. Well, otherwise they could spread out. Yeah, and that's not, what I mean. not have your two games over. Yeah, you know, rather than, have free, yeah. rather than have three games that average 11,000, you could have two games that average 15,000. Do you know what I mean? And I think... You know, already you've got what are we like start of May, and already I'm seeing games. And I'm thinking we've already seen this game. Like Salford have played Leeds twice already at home, and you just like that's one each in that series, though, isn't it? You know, it's just like <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it's like, well, yeah. you're talking about attendances, but then attendance figures aren't being helped by all this other stuff that's that's going on. So. I'm conscious we've got a post here from uh, Lewis who says, "How can Dave Fern be playing for Leeds results?" He's in the hat. He's in the hat. I, I just want well, to not him himself. But, well, no, yeah. no, he, he's not. Might be able to fit his possessions in a few weeks, but you know, <laughs> that for the moment, he, he's he's not in the hat. But the discussion point is, um, right. So we've sort of gone through. You didn't really get a chance to mention it. I tried to push you on how you thought <laughs> Witness would do against Wakefield. Um, you went all quiet on me, which I've never heard of before. I think Witness will struggle. I think. I mean, I would imagine Wakefield will probably rest a few against Widnes. I think Widnes are probably at the stage where it's a bit much for them to play a Super League team. Um, obviously, they're missing quite a few bodies. You know, they, If they had a full team, maybe they, they might fancy it. But I think Widnes have got to the point where literally every fit player is playing and they're just trying to get the results. You know, the wins on the board in the Championship. Um, 
you know, I think they, they maybe have to give it a good go at Wakefield. I mean, it all depends on who Wakefield. You can imagine if Wakefield play their strongest team. Of course, Wakefield got injuries as well. If Wakefield play their strongest team, you'd imagine they'll run away quite handsome um, victors. But you never know, do you? OK, for the first time today, it's off the top of my head. So, James, would you like to explain to our newcomer, James, about how... What works? Yeah, so we'll take it in turns, draw something out of out of Dave's hat as he's presented there, and then we'll talk about the topic. And shall I draw the home teams today? Uh, you can do, yeah, not so a problem. First out of the hat, we've got Super League. Uh, right, okay, so last round of Super League. Are they all League. that generic, Dave? Oh, sorry? Are they all that generic, Super League? <laughs> It's very you. generic topic, but <laughs> hey, it would be very generic if you were just running this, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. we'd, we'd only get we'd only get with this championship. <laughs> uh, so Super League last round it was round fourteen. Uh, wins for Warrington, Wakefield, Catalan, St Helens, Salford, and of course Wigan. Where do you want to start? I think I think the big one for me is seeing Catalan. Catalan's performance was was really good. We've spoken in the last couple of weeks about how their their away form has quite frankly been a little bit shambolic. They've been they've essentially just not turned up on the road. They've not. It, it's been crazy the, the stark contrast between how they play on the road and how they play at home. It's like they've got a completely different forward pack at, at home. They seem to be this big menacing dominating team that that overrun everyone who comes to the Stadio Bear Brutus. But then over here they seem to be. A little bit timid, and they, they get run over by by whoever comes in front of them. But it was it was it was a real statement statement result, and I think it was one that they needed. The the longer the run without picking up a big statement away win goes on, I think the more questions be asked. But I think it was a, a very good performance, and the, the, there were there were some standout players in there. One man who has been in form all the way through is Tomkins. He seems to be really fine in his form now, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, it's maybe taken him a little bit of a while, which is understandable when you're making a transition moved his family over there, new way of life, new surroundings to get used to, but he's, he's, he's been very good. He's, he's, he's one of a number of playmaking options that Catalan have got in that team. You look you look at the uh, the back line and they have uh, Braden Willie Army, he's a very very handy player, but also Sammy Sony Lang, who's, who's played at six before. I think he's got got the, the number six on his shirt, but he's been playing at centre. And when you've got when you've got players like that who, who want to get involved in the Haas, want to, want to get involved with the making of the plays, then... It's only going to benefit, and you've got to remember as well. They've got they've got Greg Bird, who even though he's in the forward pack, is he's another one who he likes to he likes to orchestrate the rook, and you wonder sometimes whether some of these creative players get in the way of each other. But it look, looks now like Catalan might might have found found the winning formula. Does this say something though about the state of the competition? Because before this, I mean, Hull was sitting in third, and they've got absolutely tated by a Catalan dragon side that has been so hot and cold throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had a, I've been involved in a few discussions about on on Twitter about how um, the league's a lot more competitive, but has that come at the expense of quality? And I think if you look at beyond St Helens and Warrington at a push, the quality is dec- has declined over the past however many years. I think you look at Wakefield and Salford, for instance, and both of those teams are. Decent to watch. They seem to have got their squads in order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they seem they're, to have improved but their think, squads. I think, I think, if, yeah, I think, I think ultimately, I think, standards dropping. Yeah, I think if wait, nothing against Wakefield or Salford. I think if their teams were in the league ten years ago, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be anywhere near as successful, if you like, as they are now. Whereas now you could feasibly think you could feasibly make a case for Wakefield being the third best team. Okay. What? At the moment, whereas I think ten years ago, if that Wakefield team was in it. What do you reckon? You know, because I've I've loved some some sort of feedback on here about you know the standard of the Super League. I, I suppose the main thing is if you're enjoying the games, because sometimes we get all. Well, I mean, it's one of them. It's what what what, what what would you rather have? Do you rather have four or five really good teams that are pasting everyone else. everyone else, which is obviously sort of what we had maybe ten fifteen years ago, or do you have a bit of a more competitive league? But I think the trouble you've got at the moment is because there's so many games. It's like Hull got blown out by a Catalan. There's been a lot of blowouts, hasn't there? So even though there's been a lot of to and fro, and there's been you know Catlin have been blown out by Salford, and then you know Catlin have blown out Hull, and then you know Hull have been blown out a couple of times, but then you know like you say the third in the league, and it's just a bit like, is the format of the league not suitable for the its competitive? You know, can it's almost as if teams can afford to lose 
one here and there, which really you don't want to. You don't want to have. And, and every minute matters. Yeah, and if you if you took away them loop games, you know, if you if you're only playing twenty three games, yeah, all of a sudden Hull losing to Catalan would be a bit like, well, actually, that's going to affect our top five. Whereas at the moment they're probably thinking, well, you know, we'll pick up wins here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you reckon teams are maybe targeting? I would. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say that necessarily because I think. I think if you spoke to any coach, they'd, they'd say that you know they want to, and any player that they want to win any game. I just think sometimes you watch games and the intensity is just not there, mm -hmm. and it's almost like if the intensity is not there 10, 20 minutes in and you've gone behind, it's very difficult for you to you know to come back. Um, you know, and you, you did see that with Hull. I, I, certainly, um, the, when Hull played Warrington, you saw that, didn't you? Where Warren just absolutely blitzed, blew him yeah. away in the first 10, 15 minutes, and it was basically just a non-event, wasn't it? Yeah, and you know, you know, it's just like how, how can, what can we do to, in, in, you know, I, and there has been some good games this year, and, but like I say, I think the overall, you've also got to ask the question as well, and this isn't a criticism necessarily of Toronto, but because there's because you've got teams like Toronto, and this may happen with New York and stuff, taking ultimately them twenty five Toronto players will probably the majority of them will be playing in Super League if they weren't at Toronto. Yeah. Is that decreasing the you, you could even make the argument of witness have got Gelling, for instance. You know, there's a few other players kicking around in in championship that maybe you could say were playing Super League. Is that uh, it, are are the number of quality players spreading too thin almost? And this was another point that was raised on another show, on another channel, somewhere else, <laughs> wasn't it? Um that you've got a Toronto effect where that's pushing the price up as well. Well, that's, I mean, I, I was having the conversation with uh, with Phil Finney, the witness chief exec on on Tuesday night, where Toronto are going through an awful lot of players. Like, if you look at oh, how many they've gone through over three years, and again, I'm not criticising Toronto because they can, they can do what they want, but ultimately what happens is they'll sign, Brearley being a good example, they sign Brearley, he plays for a couple of years, whatever, but he's on a salary that you would never get anywhere else other than Toronto, mm -hmm. with all due respect to him. But what that means is he then gets frozen out because if he's not playing for Toronto, he's on contract. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have. He can dig his heels in and say, "Oh, that's a, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't. I've got a contract here. I'm not going to leave." And then he'll go and knock on witnesses' door or Lee's door and say, "Do you want to sign me?" But I want this, and they'll be like, "Well, no." Um, and then obviously, if them, it'd be interesting what happens next season because obviously they might have to compete with with them again. And to, it's going to be interesting as well if Toronto go up to Super League because at the moment they're probably spending a Super League salary cap in the Championship. But if you if you think that the team they've got now, if that team was in Super League, they wouldn't. They might. They might be. They certainly wouldn't be a top five team. Do you know what I mean? So it's like I think that's another consideration. I think is that spreading that pool a bit thinner is obviously having an impact. Uh, there's an interesting comment here from Sai who's joined us. Thanks for your comment, mate. And he says, "I feel the demise in quality." Is the argument of not using imports as much and going with homegrown young talent, but the young talent isn't there in numbers and not ready at nineteen, which then brings the quality down in the competition. Um, I mean, if you look at the best teams in Super League history, they've all been they've all been made up of quite significant homegrown players. You know, Wigan are still churning players through Leeds and Saints are still. They look churning. average though. This latest lot from Wigan coming through, they look average, bang average. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but it's like, like but it's like how long does a conveyor belt run for? Because you can't have it running. And you look know, at Leeds. Can't. Leeds seem to have come to the end of that conveyor belt. Whereas, it, whereas look at St. Helens. You know, look at St. Helens. They had they had a bit of a lull, didn't they, in the post Wellens long whatever mm. era. But if you look now, like last few years, Luke Thompson, Morgan Knowles, you've got Aaron Smith this season as well. Obviously, you're not going to get. A perfect selection every year, but it's a fair point about the imports. Mm. And again, that's that's again tied into money because obviously the NRL has carried on, you know, salary caps carried on increasing in in the NRL, and it's not matched it over here. And I suppose what we get as well, we don't get the same quality imports that we once did. Well, that, 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 yeah. well, that's it. I mean, obviously there was a little bit of a change. I mean, this season's probably the first year for quite a few years where you could probably say, well, actually, we've had some decent new imports in, obviously, the market, you know, you've had Coote and Austin and, and Hurrell and, and players like that. This is probably the first year that that's happened. But then, you know, could you imagine, you know, like, again, to use another witness, when witness signed David Peachy, mm -hmm. obviously they got relegated. Yeah, you could well, never... Was it 10 games he played? At yeah, in championship in the end. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, could you imagine, there's no way that someone of his calibre now, say if there was an, an, an equivalent to him in the NRL, there's no way that they would be coming over here to play for the bottom place team. No, we get Anthony Gallin instead. And it's just, but yeah. I'm not kidding. No, no, but, but I think 
it, I think it's a fair because the problem is, is it, the minimum wage. Uh, uh, you know, sorry to use another witness. Will Matthews, you signed for witness before the start of last season, but then pulled out. Second row, went to the yeah. second row because the NRL have got a minimum wage, and ultimately, the minimum wage in the NRL is probably more than what a bottom end Super League team would pay a star import forward. And mm. so it's like, how do you compete with that? But then you've got you've got to remember as well talking about the the young players maybe not being up to scratch so to speak. But it's it's a case of you you can't expect the like you, your next generation of young players to hit the ground running. You see with a lot of examples, it maybe takes takes them a few years to develop. You look at you know, players who maybe fly the trade in a championship for a little bit until they're maybe in the 22, 23. It's not a case of them being an 18, 19 year old as have a couple of Super League games and then. They're, they're ready. They're up to scratch. I think. I think is it, 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 trouble is the decisions made at sort of nineteen at the moment. Yeah, but it? then even even when that decision's made and sometimes they let go by the top the top Super League teams and they, they could find themselves in the Championship League one. And as we've seen in the last few years, Super League teams now they aren't they aren't scared of going down to the Championship because they know that even though some players who may have been cast aside earlier in their career, if they go off to a Championship team and start start playing well, then they could could attract some interest. And I think it shows. It, it improves the quality of the championship as well, but got the likes of Joe Bullock, for example, exactly. who started a second go at and then exactly. he's, he's a regular at Wigan. He, he's but you a, don't know what that says. Whether that says Joe's been playing at the wrong level for a long while because he's gone almost straight in, hasn't he? Mm-hmm. Or have Wigan fallen that well, it's, far it's, down it's, the it's, it's a little bit of both because you look at the Wigan forward pack now compared to what it maybe was three, four years ago, and you'd say it's nowhere near yeah. the same the same level of standard. But, that, fierce, that level, but then you look at you look at someone like Bullock who's, who's had to do it an alternate route, which we're now seeing a lot of players doing, where they drop down a division, they, they cut the teeth, they, uh, they, they, they get the games under the belt, they improve the skills, and then. Look at Bullock now, and he's arguably one of Wigan's best forwards. He's, he's playing week in, week out. Sykes followed his comment up by actually saying there isn't enough money in the game over here to spur 50, 75k to run a reserve system, really. No, like, obviously, there's a bit of debate going on at the moment where I think that they're proposing that any club that runs a Category 1 academy has, will, ha- will have to have a mandatory reserve grade system, which seems a bit silly to me because you've got these clubs that are already invested in the academy but then you've got say you know you Salford's in the club Salford haven't got either They're, they'll be able to carry on without one but then a team who's already in a, invested in the academy is going to have to invest in a reserve team as well I got Salford need to count all the pennies they've got though, don't they? no with, no, with no, the, no, no, that, you know, and, and, and obviously just using them as an example of no criticism of them particularly but I think it is a fair point. I think Kieran Pertle actually said this about Lee last year. They looked at putting reserves at Lee, but they realised that ultimately if they did that, they'd basically just be taking all the under-18s players from Lee Miners. They'd basically be decimating Lee Miners' under-18s team because they'd want 10 of their players and then they haven't got a team. So it's like where... Uh, to me, the solution would probably be... And East as well in that situation. Yeah, the most... The <laughs> mo- I think the most sensible solution would probably be to revert back to the under-21s. Yeah system and have a le- and uh, enable you to have overage players because don't forget there's not it's not a case of not every Super League club's got 10 players just kicking the reels who are over 19 that can't play are they it's, it's only usually you know three or four or five players who are maybe too old to play 19s or they're coming back from fitness or whatever they're what you need so if you've got that facility where you can put two or three overage players playing in your academy surely that does what you need because what's it about? It's about getting a match fitness, isn't it, at the end of the day, or, or keeping them on track. So that's the way I look at it. But. Okay, I'm conscious of moving us on, because I know we have quite a lot in the hat. So, next discussion point, James. There's a warm one in here, Dave. Does that say Lee Centurions on it? <laughs> women's game. The women's game, yes. Um, well, interesting weekend. I was on 46 points to 18. It resulted in... The next round of the cup being drawn, that was another one where he had the, the old suit, yeah. suit and tie up for. So that's pitted Keithley Albion against Halifax, Barrow against Warrington Wolves, the RAF will take on Bradford Bulls, the British Army at home to Wigan Warriors. This for me is the tie of the round, Castleford Tigers against Featherstone Rovers, there's not a lot of love lost between those two teams. Stanley against St Helens, who are currently second in the Women's Super League table. York City Knights at home to Leeds Rhinos and Wakefield Trinity. Strangely, being drawn against Witness. Yeah, yeah. It's so, a shame he couldn't... 
It's a shame it wasn't done a few weeks ago because they could have put, done it as a Challenge Cup double header, couldn't they? Uh, women's and a men's. Yeah, there's a reason for that though because the uh, the Women's Rugby League Association was still going on because they've got like a, a winter game as well. Yeah, because they've got another Challenge Cup. There's, a, there's another Challenge Cup, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So as a result, uh, there was no Women's Super League games that took place last weekend. Um, Can we talk about you being an injury jinx, Dave? We have to the women's game. Well, I'm not quite an injury <laughs> jinx, but you can do in a second. I just want to run through these fixtures and then have a go at me. It's fine. All right, cool. All right. So, fixtures we've got Wigan against Leeds, Castleford against St Helens this week, which I'll be at. So, no doubt he'll have a go at me about injuries in a minute. <laughs> York City Knights against Bradford Bulls and Wakefield take on Featherston. Right, what was your point you going to make, mate? Well, obviously, Dave, for those who don't know, is becoming the hourly go-to man for women's commentary, women's game commentary. And it's been brought to my attention by Dave himself, it has <laughs> to be said, um, that his, his last three co-commentators have, uh, have got potentially season-ending injuries. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, on uh, Easter Monday, I worked with Lois Forsell from Leeds Rhinos, who looks like she's out for the season, knee injury. Uh, then, last Wednesday for the College Cup final and the... Schools Cup finals that we did. Um, I was working with Danny Caprim from Leeds, who's also out with a knee injury at the moment. She's on the comeback trail, and then I was working with uh, Natalie Harrowell at the weekend, who's from Featherston Rovers, who has been out with a knee injury. So I don't know whether that's a jinx, but they all look like they're coming back now, other than Lewis. Right. Well, um, we'll see. We'll see. Well, I don't know who's with you this week, but good luck to them. Well, it's Seb. <laughs> Seb from. Uh, oh well, if his knee, cast. if it, if his knee goes, then it doesn't matter, does it? Yeah, well, he'll still be able to send you stuff. Well, there we go. Yeah. yeah, well, I suppose. Well, maybe that's why they've had to draft him in. You reckon, you reckon so? Yeah, the, the England, the, England women's coach has probably had a word with the RFL. Right? The curse of the knee yeah. at that day of parking. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, right, what else in the hat then? Okay, so. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. We've got. Chris Thorman, Workington Town. Yes, so um, it became apparent at the end of last week that Chris Thorman had been appointed new coach of Workington Town, replacing Leon Price. Um, I suppose your, your, your thoughts really on him sort of coming back into the sport? Yeah, it's, a, it's nice to see him back, obviously. He's had, he's had time out of the game and he's had what all this stuff that's gone on, but I think he admitted himself he kind of... He wanted, he wanted that fresh start, he wanted the, the clean slate, and he just wanted to get back into coaching. So ultimately, when he was at Huddersfield, he did, he did, he did a good job there. And then, for, for whatever reason, it's, it's not happened the last, the last few months with, with all the stuff that's gone on. But I think he'll be a good appointment for Workington. I think if he can get that group of players playing, playing well again, get, the, get them clicking into gear, start playing some good rugby, I think, I think they'll do very well. Obviously, Leon Price, we, we said it's probably a little bit harsh to have lost his job but I think the, the thing that Workington have done well with their replacement they've brought someone who's more experienced he, he knows the game quite a lot but he's also he's, he's got a little bit of a track record of, of, of having teams play good rugby working hard for each other I think that at this moment in time that's what Workington need He was a head coach previously with York before he went over to Huddersfield mm. so this further progresses him Yeah it? I mean it's an interesting one worked because they've got the new stadium on the horizon as well so It'd be interesting that you know. Obviously, there's always there's always talk about three, five year plans, whatever. The workers have got a real opportunity for them to do that, you know. And if if Thorman's the right man or or whoever it is, they could build something there to the point where if you can bring some local players through and get promoted to championship, you have got the new stadium coming. All of a sudden, you're looking at Workington could have quite a little bit of potential. The comment that he made to me as well was the fact that there is this potential mm -hmm. within the town, within the area. We've always said it. I mean, Workington was one of the original Super League sides back in '96. You could, you would imagine that if they, if they were able to get into Championship and were pushing for the top of the Championship, they'd get a lot of neutral support because people are always banging on about getting a Cumbrian team in, in Super League, and um, you know, you'd imagine they'd get, you know, there'd probably be some players kicking around as well that might put their hand up and play, play for them as well. Um, so yeah, like I say, you, you just what you want to get to is you just hope that. They're going to allow him to have a three, four, five year plan and stick to it and not pull the rug from under him if, if they lose a few. Tell you what, they played some cracking rugby at the weekend against Hunslow. Um, and the fact that they only had 14 players available as well due to dual registration players being pulled back and other guys sadly ineligible, a couple of injuries in the squad as well. Um, so that was a real, one of the gustiest performances I've ever seen a rugby league side come up with to win that one. Righty ho, let's. 
have another one from the hat. Go on then. Back to James. There you go, James. I'm hoping to get Dave Ferner, that's who I'm hoping to get. 1895 Cup. 1895 Cup. This was another one that I drew. Um, we saw results at the weekend for Doncaster against West Wales Raiders, who I've said it a couple of times and none of you has sort of got on, but I just think they're getting worse again, to be honest now. 70 points to 60 got flogged by Doncaster. Yeah, so they brought in a few Aussies as well, haven't they? The coaches and Aussie. Uh, I've already mentioned about Workington Town defeating Huntsback, 31 points to 28, that was on the hour league app. Uh, Newcastle Thunder 38, Keith the Cougars 12, good result that. I was uh, surprised at the severity of the, the beating, to be honest, at the end of to Keithley. Uh, and finally, Oldham 48, Whitehaven 12. So that resulted in the following draw. Lee are taking on Workington, York against Newcastle, Barrow against Bradford, Batley against Rochdale, Widnes against Featherstone, one of three ties that I've picked out as the ties of the round. Dewsbury against Swinton, Halifax against Sheffield, that was my second pick. Mm. And if they wanted to go a, a completely different way and have cover one from left field, all of them against Doncaster, that could be a cracker. I'm really looking forward to the 895 Cup just because they'll be midweek games. I'm really looking forward to going to... You're about the only person that is. He's got 20 players and they're not looking Tuesday, forward to Tuesday, Wednesday playing. night, I can't wait for that. Tuesday, Wednesday night in the summer. You're used to covering football. Yeah, that's, well, that's it. Time, aren't you? Well, I mean, I, I never... I just don't understand why rugby league's aversion to midweek games. Come, the amount of part-time footballers and full-time footballers that play on Tuesday nights, and the amount of fans go, you know, why can't rugby league have a bit of that? So yeah, I'm yeah, looking forward to that. You're talking of a completely different game. I know. I understand. Up diving around. No, I, I, I understand that. We were having a conversation last week that potentially you could fix it. So you know, like Easter weekend, for instance, they could play Thursday, Friday, Thursday or Friday, then play Wednesday in the week, and then play on the Sunday the week after, couldn't they? Oh great, yeah, so so every part-time player in the country ends up going to work bashed up. That's, that's a good one. I love that. You play a welfare officer, James Gordon, and you're putting, you're putting your hat up for that. Hey, one, you, it's funny actually, you mentioned player welfare, I wanted to point this out because we've seen this on uh, Sam Tompkins' Instagram earlier this week. Matt Whitley's sunburn. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's terrible. That's player welfare, they need to get hey, some sun cream down. I'll tell you what. That sunburn is nothing compared to the squad in Fiji. No, I'm with telling you, man, he looked like a... Should have seen my shins? <laughs> yeah, he looked yeah. like a drumstick lolly. That's what he looked like. <laughs> he mustn't sell fat to 50 over in France. Uh, Fred's just tuned in. Oh, uh, good job, he's, he's wishing you well, James, for having completed your studies. Oh, thank you very much. And all the best for the future. Oh, perfect. Um, and, and he's wished me good luck for my interview tomorrow. Okay, fair enough. What's he wish James? Uh, well welcome done? back. <laughs> and he says, welcome back to the boss. Not seen him in a while. I know. <laughs> Does that mean you've got to get, you've got to wear like a, a Bruce Springsteen t-shirt? Well, <laughs> if I'm bought one, I suppose I could wear it. Oh, if we get sponsorship. It's, it's all sponsorship. It's all, all sponsorship. Lucy in our office is saying we need to plug sponsorship a bit more. So if you want to sponsor us then. Leave your name and number in the comments and we'll get someone to ring you. Uh, the hat is up for sponsorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, go on. Yeah, oh, it's James, isn't it? Yeah. How many more is in there? Oh, loads. We've got no, loads. We've got loads. Listen, you're not going to, you're not going to uh, Barcelona yet. That's next week. Next week, <laughs> Love Rugby Weekly, live from Barcelona. Uh, I'll be in Belgrade, so I don't care what these... Me and Drew will be there. <laughs> we'll, we'll try not to do it from the pool. If the flight isn't cancelled. <laughs> We've got championship. So, championship. Uh, I'll just run through these quickly. So, the results last week saw wins for Toulouse Olympic, nil in Dewsbury at Dewsbury. Halifax had a comprehensive 46 10 defeat of Barrow. Lee Centurions won a, a thrilling minute 42 38. It doesn't appear like anybody took the tackle bags in the <coughs> uh, Rochdale Hornets 10, Featherstone Rovers 56. Swinton Lions 10, Widnes Vikings 32, Toronto Wolfpack 36, Bradford Bulls 16, and York City Knights 28, Batley Bulldogs 24. Any of those which kind of catch your eye that you want to concentrate on? Uh, I, quite, I quite like the, uh, the sound of the York result. Obviously, we, we've spoken a little bit in the past about how at the start of the season, I don't know if they would have been thinking about making that top five in the championship, but then the more the weeks go on and the more, the more they can pick up those at those results it's only going to strengthen their case that yeah. if you look at their squad compared to uh, compare it to a witness a lee a, a team like that they've, they've not got the same the same depth the same big names but what they do have is a team spirit they've got they, they've got a, a group who will fight for each other and a group who they, they've got a, a lot of players who play off confidence as well so the more they, the more they get these results the more 
more likely is that they could progress higher and it was a, it was a good close result. Solid fit at the moment, aren't they young, yeah. so that's, that's really good. Uh, what about yourself, James? Anything yeah, in I mean, I think obviously in Championship now you're looking at, you almost, with all due respect to Batley, Dewsbury, Barrow, um, Swinton and Rochdale. Well remembered. Those five teams. Hey, you don't mention with this in this. There's still no, 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 a way to relegation here. No, I'm, I'm saying about them five teams. You're looking at if you're playing one of them five teams and you're in that top, whatever the number rest is nine. If you lose to one of them five teams, it's gonna prove quite costly. I think in your season, um, or you know, you're certainly gonna lose a bit of momentum in that race for the five. Um, you know, we have seen that with Witness, where Witness have lost to Batley, Jewsbury, Batley and Dewsbury, and that's really not the stuffing out. Obviously, Witness had the disadvantage of the twelve points, or whatever, but that's really not the stuffing out of their season a little bit. Um, so, you know, big result for Lee coming back late on to beat Sheffield, who obviously are still up there. Um, but, you know, you could you could certainly see the the race for that top five going all the way for the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, you've got to look down. I mean, I think it's uh, it's Halifax who are sitting down in eighth spot. And between Halifax, who are eighth, and Sheffield Eagles, who are in third, there's only two points. Yeah, and obviously, you know, you know, this weekend there's not they've not really played each other. None of them this week, really. I mean, obviously Bradford played Toronto away, which you'd probably write off anyway. But all the other, you know, like I say, I mean, Witness aren't in it, but Witness played Swinton. Um, you know, Halifax had their comfortable win over Barrow. Um, Feverston beat Rochdale, didn't they? Apart from Lee and Sheffield. You know, no one really played. No one really played against each other. So Lee are, Lee are probably the big winners this week because they've won a game against one of the teams around them. Whereas all the other teams have basically just gone achieved par. Really, mm -hmm. you want to be winning them games. So it'd be interesting to see how that how it all develops in the next few weeks. And it's your turn for the next round. He's 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 dying Ooh. to get there further. Underrated players. Underrated, underrated players. players. So players. Right. we sort of reached the halfway point of the season, and I wanted to sort of test your metal a bit and you at home as well. Of who you player. think of all the teams that you've seen this year, who is your, your most underrated player? So that could be a Super League, could be a Championship. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one. I think obviously being being a Warrington fan, I'd, I'd have to pick a pick a Warrington player, and one player who I think who has gone a bit under the radar has been Joe Philbin. Obviously, very he, good season so played, far. Yeah. He has been fantastic this season. I think in, in our team of the week that we do every week, he's, he's played. He's, he's made that team a couple of times. His, his stats are always brilliant. He's not afraid of a carry. He always makes good yardage, and I think he's, he seems to have stepped up a gear. Obviously, he's, he's played a lot of games in the last couple of years, and he's he's been more of a squad rotation player. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say, but now in this Warrington setup, even though the the forward pack, there's arguably more competition for places. Is is taking his chance when he's got it, and you got players like Ben Westwood, Lama Tazi, who aren't getting in the team now because it seems there seems to be a willingness from Steve Price where if if some of his players who were given a chance step up, then he's more than happy to keep them. You, you look at as well Matt Davis in from London, and now he's got his chance. He's, he's starting to get a few games. He is, he's, he's getting, and he's been another one who's been absolutely fantastic. He's rediscovering that that form that he had for uh, for London last season, but. Yeah, I think Phil would have to be up there. I was actually I was talking to Drew earlier in the week about uh, the Great Britain squad for the end of the year. All right, okay. And we, we were actually debating whether it should be the case where you have to have one Welsh player, one Scottish player and one Irish player in the Great Britain team. <laughs> what, just a token? <laughs> yeah. Well, I it think should be the best, the best no, for the job, isn't no, it? No, I, I, the, we, we talk about it. I, I personally think that they should have at least one from every nation. And you look at, you look at the... the Quarter spot. Yeah, well, well, it's, it's well, yeah, but are they going to be from the actual nation? Wales accepted. Well, yes, yeah, Lachlan Coote, Lachlan Coote, Scotland. I know, but he's Get not Scottish, is he? I mean, yeah, obviously he plays for Scotland, but he's not Scottish. But if you had, if you had a, the old grandparent rule, yeah, if you had, but if you had a Lachlan Coote, if you had a for Wales, you've got obviously you've got Regan Grace, you've got Morgan Knowles who has played there. You have got Ireland. You've got you've got Mickey McAlor, who probably won't get in. You've got Joe Philbin. So you've got a lot of players who. They played. They played for different countries, and I, personally, I'd like to see one from every one from every country get in, even if it is just a token spot. I think if we're calling it a Great Britain team, I think that it, or essentially, if there's if it's only English players, I think it's basically a glorified England team, which kind of defeats the whole point. But I think we're having a Great Britain team that has to be represented from every aspect of it. Okay, I'm conscious we've sort of moved away from that. So underrated players. Underrated James. players. I I. I don't know whether he is underrated, yeah. but Grant Millington at Castleford. Grant Millington is a great shout, actually. I think because yeah, I player, think, Grant. Cause, I mean, obviously, I think, obviously, people, 
acknowledge that she plays for one of the best teams. He offers something different. But yeah, I just world, think I just think that if you look at where he's gone from when he started, when he joined Casford to where he is now, you know he's a, you know re- you know really solid. Always puts his hand up. Good carry. Oh, you know, plenty of offloads, tackles well. Him and Liam Watts, brilliant in the in the front row for for Casper. I know they've lost their way a little bit yeah. um, through injury and whatever. But Lewis agrees with you. He's got uh, Matt Davis down. Yeah, as as his his player. Uh, Sai's done pretty well. He's picked a Super League player, a Championship player, and a League One player. So he's he's <laughs> he's bashing us for knowledge at the minute. Uh, so in Super League, he's gone for Alex Wormsley. Yeah. Although one time, well, he's not really I, underrated. I, I though, he's not it? underrated. He's just. It's just it's cons- it's consistent. <laughs> he's a beast and he's consistent, isn't it? Um, in the championship, he's gone for Robinson, the scrum half at York, which I think he's quite a good chance actually. Good I, my my underrated. I'm, I'm just being trying to think of, of this for the championship. Um, a player that I like. Or I I mean I don't know whether he's, Simon Brown. I thought was exceptional for Dewsbury when mm-hmm. I seen them play. Um, you know, and I think he's probably someone that, that's maybe not got the raps necessarily that that um, that he's deserved. Um, but there's a, there's a few. I think there's a few. There's a few decent forwards kicking around. With Michael Ward's another good one in, in Championship who who plays uh, for uh, Huntsley or Oldham. He was at Oldham, wasn't he? Yeah. Michael Ward. Yeah, and obviously he was at Batley. He was at Batley at one point as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's at Batley now. He's still at Batley. No, he's at Batley now. Um, still Michael Ward's one at Batley who, who always puts a puts a hand up and um, yeah. The, 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 this, this. I like I like Setter Tyler as well who's over at Batley. He's yeah. a he's a good. When player. you look through the championship and we spoke before about how there's a, there's so many good players in the championship who are crying out for a spot of Super League. I think there are a lot of like underrated players who maybe don't get the spotlight. One player who I've spoken about before, Chester Butler. I think he he's another one who. He's been consistent in his performances for a few years now, and if there's if there's a, I'm sure he must be on the radar of a few Super League teams as maybe one of the next ones who could make that step up. Uh, Kenny Baker is one that Sai mentions. I remember seeing Kenny Baker years ago. He plays for uh, North Wales now, but I remember seeing him coming through the ranks at one of the Wigan clubs from an amateur point of view, and I always thought that he was a, a really decent player. So yeah, yeah. I thought it was a nice little discussion point. If you've got any others, just drop them in the comments and uh, I might, it might be something that we come back to in future shows. But, moving on as time does. Back down, let's have a look who we've got. Let's see if we get Ferner out of the hat. David Ferner leads Rhino. Oh, you've been dying for that one. Is he, he's, he's even got it down to, to you know, you're after, you're after this job, aren't you? Of actually presenting. There you go, David Ferner. Was this a shot for you? It did, I mean, uh, he's been getting a bit of grief, hasn't he? And I think there's been quite a few vocal calls on Twitter and stuff about getting rid of him. And obviously, he referred to the online uh, comments, didn't he, in one of his press conferences. But uh, you know, and as bad as as bad as Leeds have been, I think you, I, I just think you're a bit like uh, to change your coach after six months. Is that really? You know, are they are they really that much at fear of relegation? They're not. I don't think they are. Kevin Sinfield as well. Should he not take some of the blame for this? Because he appointed him and he actually said he was the best candidate. Well, I don't. Well, I mean, what, what, what's and that, and I suppose that's the big thing, isn't it? What's different now than six months ago? Okay, yeah, they've they've had a poor start to the season, but there's a lot of stuff going on at Leeds, and obviously the transition. You know, he bought a new. They bought quite a few new players, didn't they? And. Um, you know what do you what what do you achieve now by sacking him? And then I mean I mean Lucy said before actually made a good point that um, at least the coach that they bring in now will have the rest of this season to sort of mould what they want ahead of recruiting in the off season. He gets for, ne- look at him, for next season, yeah, and that's maybe where Ferner you know might have struggled a little bit. I think it's almost like a working interview, isn't it, for any yeah, player moving I, forward. I mean, I think I think Lola here was a big problem. Uh, I think Lola here's been a big problem, not in terms of his character or anything like that, but I just think they it doesn't really fit in, does yeah, it? Yeah, and that's right. it. I think they they obviously signed him thinking he'd play six with Myler because you know Jack Walker's the Leeds number one without question. He needs to be the Leeds number one for the next ten years. You know. But you could also argue that Lola he has played his best rugby at the moment at fullback. But that, but that's what I mean. But it's like they don't yeah. need a fullback, do they? Because you know they've even got Ashton Golden who's twiddling his thumbs all playing for Featherstone most weeks. 
So it's like even if Jack Walker's not in form or needs pushing, Ashton Golden's there, and I think I think that from to have a player. To have a player, a marquee player, or well, it wasn't marquee, but to have a, a high, highly paid, highly rated NRL player come in and not have a fixed position in your team is that's probably been for me the main, the big letdown for Leeds. Now, obviously, you can talk about you know have a few players played on for too long. Have they got you know? Is Ferris still up to that level? Is Ablett still up to that level? Is even Jamie Jones who can and are they still up to the level that Leeds? require but at the same time all those questions are still unanswered mm. whoever the coach is congratulations yeah. to jamie jones buchanan actually 20 years as a professional and actually a brilliant interview piece with rob conlon on the site actually which has been up for a couple of months actually but uh, he had a really lengthy sit down with jamie jones i think it's three thousand worder so a nice long feature piece for those who some some great stories in there with, with jamie jones buchanan but you know right I think it's a fair point you make about about Kevin Sinfield, but I just think, I just think, why would you? What is the issue? Like, why would you sack him now? Because hmm. they're not going to get relegated, Dave. Yeah. James, I was be. conscious that you pulled it out of the hat and you not yeah. had to think about it. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's a bit interesting. I think he probably he might have jumped the gun a bit too soon. There's 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 a lot of calls for him to. For, for him to go and obviously the fans haven't been happy with, with the rugby you've mentioned quite a few of the issues I think you can't look as well past the fall apart we've mentioned some of the names in there the likes of Ablett Ferris Jones Buchanan you wonder for whoever the new guy is coming in it will be it probably will be a, a, an off season of transition because you, you think about the players the players who they've brought in like Ava Semifanai and um, you got Wellington Albert who came in. I, I see. You got you, you mentioned that you you was watching his video, wasn't you? Was, was, yeah. How you pronounce his name? <laughs> yeah. I like that. Was he, you just called him Ava last week. Yeah. And to be honest, so did I. <laughs> but yeah, he he'll, he'll, he might take a bit of time to get used to it, and I think bringing him over halfway through the season might do him good in terms of next season because it, it it'd be nice for him to have a have a taste of Super League and have a full pre season under his belt, mm-hmm. and then properly get going next year. You wonder whether. Well into now, but next season whether he'd still be there, it's it's an interesting one. I can't I can't see him, can't see him sticking around because I don't think he's up he's up to that level really. He was more of a stopgap when you look at the underperforming Leeds pack. They needed to do something, and the fact that he was out there and available maybe twisted their arm a little bit. But but yeah, in terms of in terms of the new coach that comes in, I think I think they will have a bit of a rebuilding job, especially if some of those older players choose to choose to hang up the boots or move on to pastures new. Question to both of you then. Um, who do you reckon is in the frame for it? You know, because obviously, in various other points, there's there's, there's several names that have, have been mentioned. I've got one to chuck in here from Fred. He says that uh, Sean Wayne, he reckons is today's hot favourite for the Leeds job. Is this more fuel on the what's happened behind the scenes at Wigan? I think. Um, I think the thing with Leeds is if you look at obviously they've had this period of say five years where they've had all these icons retiring, Simpio Peacock, Lou Lai. Borough, Maguire, moved on, whatever. And I think if you look at during that period, they've recruited poorly. They've not. Can you can you name a player that Leeds have signed from somewhere else over the last five years who really has stepped up to the plate for them and provided them with something that they they either didn't have or they needed? And I don't think you can. We had a brief conversation didn't we about succession planning and it doesn't yeah. seem to have and, 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 and I think the pro- and I think the danger is at the moment is they're still throwing out and bringing signings in without a clear plan of what, where they're going you know they should they need to be looking well who's going to be the, the scrum half in five years time or three years time but also they need to make that decision who's going to be the coach who well no yeah of course I, sorry I was, so I, was, I was building up to that I was thinking yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. maybe because of that struggle with recruiting are they yeah. then looking well actually we need to figure out how we can bring through our own players better. Right, okay. And obviously, Sean Wayne, you know, there's been no one better than Sean Wayne. Well, it was him. a good a good piece that appeared yeah, on the side, wasn't there, about, about the amount players. of players that now, he's... Now, you know, Sean Wayne, whether he can bring that level of drive and passion that he has for Wigan to somewhere else, because I, I honestly believe that Sean Wayne's passion for Wigan was probably worth ten percent of every performance that one of his players put out for him. Now, is that because he's Wigan through and through, or can he instill that in another team? Um, but certainly, I think if I was Leeds, I'd get Sean Wayne. 
Uh, there's a, an interesting uh, comment that Lewis makes. Thanks again, mate. He says, uh, Sean Wayne won't come in and have Sinfield telling him what he can and can't do. There's no chance of that. Well, I mean, it, it is Sinfield, does Sinfield tell him what he can and can't do? Because I think, is Sean Wayne a coach that wants to come in and say, I want to sign him, him and him? I don't think he is. I think Sean Wayne's the sort of coach who wants to go in in front of a group of players and say, right, I'll look after you, I'll look after you, we'll develop you, we'll make you better and do it that way. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 I wonder whether Sean Wayne's quite... I mean, don't get me wrong, he obviously won't want to be told everything what to do, but I, I don't think Sean Wayne would be too averse to Simfield saying, what, we're going to sign player X, Y and Z. Fred's kind of agreed with Lewis as well. He says, for his two penneth, um, maybe the trouble at Wigan was Ridlinski pulling the strings. Yeah, possibly. Well, I, I'd probably go against your point in terms of Wayne. I think in terms of the, the grander scheme of things, what is setting up for, for in years to come, I think he would want that control. He would want to decide where what direction the club's going. And you, you look at Kevin Sinfield, maybe he... We, we obviously don't know how much of an impact he's having behind the scenes, but Sean Wayne, if he goes in, I think he would, would want to do things his way because he could point to his time at Wigan and say, right, we... If I if I have the chance and I obviously Radlinski probably did have a bit of an impact there at Wigan as well, but I think Sean Wayne did have quite quite a big say in what was happening behind the scenes, and you wonder if Simfield would want to want to give up a little bit of that power to Wayne, who undoubtedly has got the nucleus. If if he came in and always prowess with the young players, he's got a good nucleus there. He's got a lot of a lot of young guys. Spoke about Jack Walker. You've got a couple of guys coming through in the forward pack. Even the likes of Watkins. You've got Brad Singleton who've been around a little bit now and there. Kind of the elder statesman who you can track, you want to keep in that team and form the team around. You've got the likes of like Harry Newman as well, out in exactly. the and, you, and you've got, and you've got Callum McLennan as well, who's not had a chance in the first team yet. But there's that amazes me. They've, well, they've run through all these these issues with the halfbacks and they've not actually tried Callum. Well, that's something that I've seen with a lot of fans saying as well. The fact that the the brought they've got this guy in is he's a young talent, is a raw talent by all accounts, and we're, considering they've they've not been able to find that formula. You wonder why he's not getting the shot. Obviously, Liam Sutcliffe, it, it appears like they're trying to mould him into into that sixth position, which is quite an interesting one, really, because they've not really been able to make their minds up about him. You, you look at where he's been playing recently. He's, he's had games at loose forward, games at six, games at second row, games at centre, and that's going to do nothing for his confidence and nothing for his ability to grow. So He's become Mr Utility. I, 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 think, I think with Wayne, I, I, I just sort of think, look at Wigan's success with Wayne. They won Super League last year and Radlinski's been there during that time. So I just think that Wayne coaches the team to win. And I just I think that, you know, no matter what goals are about signing players and whatever, and, you know, we don't know what happened at Wigan particularly. Maybe it'll um, all come out in the wash if he gets a I mean, I mean, I mean, I would I mean, I mean you don't know. I mean obviously Sean Wayne's probably looking at thinking, well hang on, we're losing three of our best players at what you know, who are we signing and obviously maybe didn't get the answers he wanted, but then there was a lot of questions about style of rugby and all that, but as far as I'm concerned, look at what Sean Wayne won at Wigan, look at the number of players he brought through, <coughs> I just I, I just think he, he could do a job at Leeds. Uh, Lewis has added, Sean Wayne is a fan of a strong coaching group, just like the Wire, with Price, Breers and Hendo, who all have input into the team and what goes on, and, apparent, and he reckons that Leeds structure is nothing like that. I mean, we can't well, it's, a, it's a bit top heavy, isn't it? It's a bit, it's a bit top heavy, isn't it? Because I suppose when you talk about coaching structure, you want to have your head coach and then you your assistants working beyond. But if you've then got Kevin Sinfield as your director of that, rugby, yeah, yeah. and then you've got you know people aside him and whatever, because they've got quite a few ex players floating around doing various jobs, haven't they? At Leeds, um, you know, who knows what happened? I mean, in terms of other candidates, I've not really seen anyone that. That really, I mean, obviously Shane Panigan's been mentioned. Obviously, Richard Barsha was spotted at the game, and but Rick, Richard surely would be looking more towards an assistant job at the moment. Because yeah, well, I mean, he, I heard he, well, that, he's only had the he's only had the one. I heard that Chris, job, I heard that Chris Thorman had been approached for the assistant job as well, which is an interesting one. But I think if 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 Marshall was to go in as head coach, I think that points towards Simfield being more of a. A bit like when James Lowe's came in last year, and I think yeah. that's where it's a bit of a peculiar one because it's like, well, hang on, how has how has Kevin Sinfield's job changed from when he took over? He had James Lowe's as coach. Has Dave Ferner effectively come in to do what James Lowe's was doing, mm. or was he doing other things? And I think that's the little bit of a grey area Leeds have got now that they probably need to iron out. 
Well, especially as well if you look at if you look at that that Leeds setup. You if you brought in say hypothetically if you got Sean Wayne as head coach, brought in Marshall as his number two, then you've got Sinfield to throw into the mix, and then obviously you've got Richard Agar. Where where would that leave him? It's a case of they've got got a wealth of a wealth of coaches who probably all have a different way of running it. You think maybe that falls possibly too many. I could see it working if it was Wayne kind of. Giving giving guidance to Marshall's his number two that that could that could work well but I think you, you look at the different the different coats they've got in there and you wonder whether there's too many cooks so to speak. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Right, let's move on. Back on to James. <laughs> da, 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 da. Amateur game. Amateur game. Right, so I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. Oh. So the amateur game this week back in full swing. I just kind of really, with this one, wanted to touch upon who's top of the leagues at the moment. I thought it's an interesting point where, uh, for the bulk of it, we're seven, eight, nine, sometimes ten games into the season, depending on which division. So, in the Premier Division, you've got Wathbrow Hornets on top of the league. So, good to see them sort of bouncing back. Um, Cumbrian, of course. I yeah. know you was looking at them last week, weren't you, for a, yeah. a couple of the results that they've had so far this season. Yeah, they've been very good. And obviously, we, we spoke as well about... I was the top four all playing each other. We said it'd be a pivotal week for the table. Uh, and, and so, so yeah. it's proved, really. So, Westall second, Necromont third, Hunslet Club Parkside fourth. Division one sees Pilkington, Rex, and St. Helens unbeaten. Eight from eight. That's one hell of a start to the season, isn't it? Pretty good going. Uh, also the top four there, York, Acorn, Wigan, St. Pat's, and Milford. Division two, Intros Bridge are top. Good to see Intros Bridge bouncing back. Bradford, Dudley Hill, West Bowling and Barrow Island who only got promoted last season taking that fourth spot. And Division 3, this is where it's happening. Not only Ali East in this division, which is why I always like mentioning it, but there's a real scramble. If you thought the Championship was interesting with the, so many points between teams, the top team in Division 3 has 14 points and the team down in 7th has 12. <laughs> so there's nothing at all there. So that was kind of what I was wanting to, to, to sort of mention. Um, looking at those top teams this week, uh, there's an interesting Cumbrian derby in the Premier Division. Kells against Wathbro. That'd be a good game, wouldn't it? Should be. In Division 1, uh, Pilkington Rex have to go to Featherstone Lions. Got a few friends in there now, the last week. <laughs> uh, Division 2 sees Intros Bridge travel over to Bradford Dudley Hill. That should be a carcass, shouldn't it? That? Yeah, so Bradford will well, they'll be able to close in on the leaders, shall we say? And then in Division 3, Woolston, who are they playing? They're at home to Oldham St Anne's, who've had a bit of a mixed season. They've only won three of the ten games so far, but uh, that's your amateur roundup. Mm. Back on to me, let's see what we've got. We need some brief ones, because we'll be here till Christmas otherwise. Choice Stop of TV. panicking, have you got a meeting? Have you got a meeting? <laughs> got <two> games? <laughs> Choice of TV games. Choice of TV games, right. Where, where shall we go on this one? I think they'd be rubbish this last few weeks, I'll be honest. Casper are on a lot, aren't they? How can, how can you put Wigan on two weeks? I mean, that was that's two weeks of my, two, oh, it felt like well, two weeks I mean, of my life that I'll never get back. That I mean, it's worth, it's worth noting that obviously they pick them when the fixtures come out, and obviously you wouldn't have expected Wigan to be naff. But, but why would you have put London on? Well, because yeah, they would have yeah. expected London to be yeah, down yeah. at the bottom anyway. I think the problem is you don't want... I, I, just, I mean, with all due respect to London, I wouldn't want a London home game on Sky because it just looks like a par... Park League, with all due respect to that facility, I'd almost be reluctant to put Casford and Wakefield on telly at home because I just don't think it portrays the image that you know we're all there's all this song and dance about attracting big commercial and broadcast partners in America, and then your big Thursday night, Friday night TV game is is at is at Casford or Wakefield's ground, which don't really. So what, what would you pick then? Would you pick sort of a Saint Helens because they're winning every week? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying. You know, obviously, you want to try and you want competitive games. I mean, to be fair, there's there's generally three games a week now, isn't there, televised? Because Catalan are on most weeks. So which is another not... discussion point in itself, which we're not going. So there. you haven't got much to pick from anyway. It's not as if if they weren't showing Wigan London, there was a plethora of other games that they could have put on. Um, I, you know, I. I it doesn't really bother me necessarily who's on so much, but um, yeah, sometimes I, I would agree with the thing. Why would you put Wigan London on? Because as much as it was, well, it was only eighteen eight or whatever it was. It's a bit like you would have expect when you picked that, you'd have expected Wigan probably to put forty on them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. 
You know, I I, I sort of feel like the Thursday nights should be a little less high profile game. So I I prefer on a Thursday night to see, with all due respect, again, I I prefer to see say Huddersfield against Salford or something on a Thursday night, and make sure the Friday night game is your big Wigan Leeds Warrington or Saints, because they're the big clubs, you know, and it's like. You know, if you looked at football, they wouldn't. They would never tuck away one of the big clubs on a, you know, Saturday lunchtime or whatever. They always have the big games as the prime time Sunday. Yeah. Anything you can add to that, James? Yeah, I agree with James talking about obviously if you're looking looking ahead to the future and you wanna you wanna attract these these broadcast partners, get these deals over the line. I think the image you you need to set a higher higher image, and I think. There are there are enough good grounds in a league. Even even you look a bit further down the lines of a Hull FC, a Hull uh, There's still 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 good grounds, and I think they're the ones that you, you need to you need to get on. But yeah, I think as you said, the, the the Friday games have to be have to be your big teams. That should be the the one where you get the viewing figures, you get all the big matches and the big roundups. Uh, James, you'll be pleased to know. Oh, is that the last one? Got the last one. So we have Matt Callan in at Rochdale Hornets. I've said this that. Rochdale uh, compl- were a complete mess when I seen them. Um, I think they signed, they seemed to recruit well, but they were just so haphazard. I mean, Scott Moore should be the first name on that team sheet at Hooker. He's not played for any team, month though. I don't he's care, been... Dave, but why sign him? Somewhere else, if he's, not, it? if he's not good enough to be playing, don't sign him. He's a Hooker. He should be playing at Hooker. And he's the best option they've got at Hooker. But instead, they've got about six Hookers playing in the 13. You've got Moore's playing at six. You've got Ben Moore's playing at seven. They've got Stuart Howarth in there. And it's just, it, honestly, when I seen them, none of them had a clue what everybody else was doing. You've got Tyler Whitaker's playing at fullback. Mm. And it's just like they were a complete mess. So you play quite a bit in academy rugby at fullback, though. I'm not, surprised that. That, I'm not surprised that they changed coach. And I think... Matt Callum would probably get older them and, and sort them out. Um, you, could, you could also argue, though, I mean, you were saying, you know, regarding Leeds that they pulled the trigger too early. I, just, I mean, I just think, I just think, I mean, we've all, you know, Carl Forster, you know, spoke to him a few times, decent, decent uh, bloke. He's only 26. He'd still do a job playing for somebody, wouldn't well, he? Well, he has been playing like and obviously that's caused some issues. No, I mean, no. Oh, well, no, yeah, exactly. Well, I would imagine that was probably why there was an issue with him leaving because... If you're a player coach and they don't want you as coach, you've still got a contract as a player. Mm, it leaves a gap in your squad as well, then, doesn't it? Um, you know, I'm, de- I'm delighted think... for Matt Callan. I want to get that out there because yeah, um, when, when he I had saw... success at Halifax, obviously. And... When it, when he was at Halifax, I mean, they played some scintillating stuff. I'm sure that people watching this will, re- will remember the, the days when Halifax used to be on television fairly regularly. <laughs> um, but but yeah, they, they were they were brilliant. I believe Martin Hall's back involved. At yeah, well, they're, tra- they're trying to fundraise, aren't they? It'd be interesting to see whether any amateur lads step up from Mayfield and and play. Um... I mean, there's a couple that have gone. I mean, in, they've had in, already in, in recent uh, years, and also lads who have ended up going to other championship clubs. So well, you look like at Paul Braley over at Batley, for example. Well, obviously, you look at. I mean, we talk about like Siddle, like Garrett at Siddle, who went to Dewsbury. Oh, he's having a cracking season. And he's season, having a good season. Yeah. There's obviously players there, so you'd like to think that maybe someone like Callum would have his finger on the pulse in terms of the amateur game, and maybe add some because you know Rochdale haven't got a massive budget, but it's certainly. I wouldn't want to be getting relegated from Championship in the next... Well, I mean, obviously ever, but I wouldn't want to be going down this season or next because the landscape of the game is going to change massively because of the funding and all that. So it's like... So in essence, they've they've made the right decision at the right time for them. I think think so. I'm not sure that Forster was the right choice in in the first place. He didn't... He didn't... He did okay at Wave, but he wasn't pulling up any trees, I don't think. Um, And obviously, Alan Kilshaw had done a decent decent job um, they were fairly steady obviously they got the reprieve you know basically from relegation um, so yeah they probably just needed a bit of a bit of new a bit of a fresh a bit of new direction and it'd be interesting to see but like I say Scott Moore I've got a start hooker uh, final word James yeah I think going back to like you spoke about the good rugby that, that you've seen in the past I think every, every club wants that and I think that's that's something that will come down the line as he instills his philosophy but I do think, in terms of the players he's got in the squad, it's it's quite heavy in certain positions, and I think as now he's come in, I think the first thing you have to do is look at that team and essentially stop putting square pegs in round holes. He needs to play players in their actual position, and maybe then we'll start to click into gear. 
So that's it. That's all that we've got time for here on Love Rugby League Weekly in association with Betfred. Thanks for bearing with us and uh, we'll be back again very soon.